Now I would like to welcome up uh, Marita Mukkonen. Uh, you're the director of artists at RISK, uh, based in Finland, but working in many places oh, sorry, uh, around uh, the world. Uh, do you want to come closer? Yes. Or do you yeah, come closer. Yeah. It's nicer, because I will stay up here and talk with you a little bit. And um, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about freedom of culture during crisis and war. But first of all, it would be great to just hear a short introduction about what is artists at risk and what do you do? First of all, uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. And it's great to be on the stage after Lucille. We have been in Dutch for quite a while and it is great to be here in the same event. Uh, very shortly, what Artists at Risk does is that we work in the intersection of arts and human rights. And we started our work in 2013. So we have been working for more than 10 years. And uh, we do very hands-on work, which means that we work with art practitioners at risk around the globe who are at risk because of their artistic activities. They are often human rights de defenders, as we heard from Lucine. They are at risk because they are standing up for uh, human rights, for democratic values. What is specific in Artists at Risk and why we started to work together with the co-founding director, uh, Ivor Stodolsky, is that we come from arts and culture. And uh, we had been working since 2007, for example, with many dissident artists from Russia, from Perestroika times, also from Belarus, from Ukraine. And, and we were working it basically on the archival exhibitions. We were working with the artists who were part of the Perestroika movement at that time. And unfortunately, what we witnessed that some of those artists who were dissidents in Perestroika times are actually artists we are hosting or got out of Russia after the Russian full-scale invasion in Ukraine. So also, also our work developed out, out of our practice and especially after the wave of uh, revolutions which started in Northern Africa. We were, uh, we were working that time in Egypt, in Tunisia, with artists and activists who joined the democratic movements, the movements which spread from the uh, Jasmine Revolution to Tahir Square, to Polotnaya Square in Moscow, to Taksim Square in Turkey. People People were connected by the same idea. They were asking for social and political justice. But as I said, we started in 2013, and by that time there was a backlash, and many of our peers and colleagues were in that situation, that they were being tortured in Egypt. They were prisoned, and we were thinking, what can we do as a part of our curatorial practice we were working in artistic context in, in, with artists in residences and it was very natural. We started to provide our colleagues and peers residences into artistic context so that they could get out, get a breather, but at the same time they would be hosted by their colleagues, art professionals. As we all know, like Lucine, dissident artists are often very good artists. And I think any of us, if we have to flee, it would be great to be welcomed by our colleagues. So that's the core idea of our work. We organize uh, artists in residences, temporary relocations from three to 24 months around the globe nowadays. We have more than 300 hosting organizations from India to Zambia, to Sweden, to Finland, to Germany. I think, I mean, you're the civil society, so we have had like the artist's perspective and also earlier, of course, but uh, w why do you think it's important also that civil society comes in and, and what, are the, what are the tools that civil society has that maybe we as government agencies don't have? I don't know if you want to reflect on that. Yeah, I think it's, it's this kind of a, we had the power that, that we are peers. I said that we have more than 300 hosting organizations now as artists at risk. And unfortunately, it's basically hundreds of organizations joined artists at risk after Russian full-scale invasion to Ukraine. 
it came very close to us in Europe. For the first time, it is this, our 10 years of the work before the artist applied to Artist at Risk. Our partners and hosting organizations and peers were in touch with us and asked, what can we do? Can we host some artists? So actually there was this realization, what does it mean when the war was very close to European borders? Unfortunately, I'm saying unfortunately because it took this war also really to wake up to this kind of peer support. It didn't happen when we work with Afghanistan and we still work with Afghan artists at risk, basically. There are almost 800 verified cases back in Afghanistan. Some of them are already dead while they have been waiting for the relocation and visas. But what Ukraine showed in civil society and for art institutions is that if there's a political will to give visas, there is willingness also in the field of art to actually open their doors. Mm. So in our hosting organizations, we have big museums such as ZKM in Karlsruhe or opera houses or Finnish National Theater. We don't only work with artists in residences, but we have all kinds of institutions in our hosting network. And uh, we can only do the work with not so much resources. We are an NGO. But we can do it because we have so many peers, so many colleagues from big museums to small artist run spaces who are willing to work with it. But what we need is more cooperation with governmental and intergovernmental organizations and support. And mm. therefore, we are really happy. I'm really happy to be in Sweden because, for example, the Artistic Freedom Program of Swedish Arts Council has been an extremely important funding tool to run artist at risk secretariat who can do this work. And also with the war in Ukraine, we started cooperation with UNESCO. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen with Afghanistan. We were in touch with UNESCO and asked that if we could work together. But then thanks to support of Norway and UNESCO Ashberg program, for the first time, UNESCO considered living artists as cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. And that, that's amazing shift. <laughs> that living artist also has to be protected. We heard earlier today about a living song. And yeah. of course, it is that that's something. It's natural when you think about it. But now it's recognized, and UNESCO also it's has published uh, a report about artistic freedom. And it's, it's kind of recognized how artists are human uh, rights defenders how, and how they are essential part but do you think maybe rights. also, I mean, one thing, of course, is that uh, maybe there's more pressure uh, within UNESCO from different countries, depending on what war is going on, etc. But uh, could there also be that there has been an increased knowledge, actually, about artists as human rights defenders, and also as just being artists, because sometimes they're not human rights defenders, as in Afghanistan, just, it's just illegal. Uh, you cannot work as a woman artist you, uh, at all, and, and also with music, etc. So what do you think? Could it also have to do that, that the world is becoming more aware? Of course. I think that that's, that's what's happening, that there's more and more kind of also knowledge, there's more and more research of the role mm -hmm. of artists and cultural workers. As, also, as Lucine showed, that of course artists always have played a role. If we, if we look at the Soviet times, we probably know, know, know the best. Mm -hmm. But it has been recognized also as we speak. I know that in Brussels, there's also a discussion going on right now today mm -hmm. about artistic freedom in the EU level. Mm -hmm. And there's more and more awareness about yeah. it is the fact that artists are human rights defenders. And as you say, again, like in the places like Afghanistan, it is another aspect that it's basically the whole social group is actually kind of at risk or discriminated because they are art practitioners. Mm. They are murdered for their music. Mm. And therefore, we come to this issue that therefore they should be recognized as a social group so that they would be entitled to protection. Mm. And that's another step in this kind of recognition. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering a bit as well, because you said you had you worked a long time with Russian dissident artists and Belarusian artists, but now you also work with quite a lot of Ukrainian artists. And um, 
How has that come about? And is it especially for their art, or is it because there is a war? It's, it's because uh, there is a war. I mean, that that's was... I think it's there were two shifts in our work. It's basically we, we worked at the beginning with artists who were human rights defenders and, and, and uh, as said, at risk because of their work for political reasons. With Afghanistan, it was the first mass relocation. We, we worked, it's, we, we changed our whole way of working because of that. And therefore, we had a mechanism ready when the war in Ukraine started. So we, we were ready to start to relocate and protect also Ukrainian artists. And many organizations turned to us, such as UNESCO, Goethe Institute uh, in, in, in Germany, and so on, to work with relocations. But here, it's important to emphasize that from the very beginning, what we recognized that we also had to do work in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And we created, for example, an uh, internal residency network within Ukraine. And that was working after two months because since the beginning we worked with the Ukrainian Ministry of, of Culture and they want to stop brain train. And unfortunately, our funding for that network stopped two months ago. Mm. And from, that has been the core of our work, is that, that those Ukrainian artists and men who can't leave can stay in their countries and now we are facing a second wave. We have many uh, artists who are war veterans. They don't have yes. any support for their work. And there are very little funding tools for that. So, of course, I mean, it's changed the nature of our work. We relocated more than uh, 500 Ukrainian artists within Ukraine and outside of Ukraine. But I, I think that here especially it's, it's, it's really important to continue supporting art practitioners within Ukraine because you, there are no resources for that. Mm -hmm. Do you know how many other artists you have relocated altogether in, in your work? We, we have relocated over the last two years around uh, 750 artists, mm -hmm. and out of them around 100 are Russian and Belarusian dissidents, and the rest are from the rest of the world, and that figure tells you it's, it's, it's around 100 artists from elsewhere. And we are still working with Afghanistan. And I have to say that after two and a half years, we are finally getting Afghan artists at risk to Germany. Mm -hmm. Our team has been working with the paperwork more than two years, mm -hmm. which means that in our work, it, it's, it's this, these conflicts and wars, they are not over. We are working with Sudan. We, we are working with Afghanistan. We are working, we should have resources to work within Ukraine and so on. And that's one of the challenges in our work, that the political gaze is, is changing. And at the same time, the policy emphasizes is changing. Mm -hmm. But in our work, these are ongoing issues. Mm -hmm. So what would you say is the, the biggest challenge that you face in the work that you have? The biggest challenges are visa regimes, of course. Mm -hmm. We should really have an EU-level humanitarian visa. It is to protect human rights defenders and artists who are human rights defenders. We had to make a clear difference that there are governments and there are dissidents and oppositions. And we had to protect those people who are ready to risk their lives, to stand up for democratic values, to stand up against their governments. And when they need protection, they have to be protected. Sometimes they can be protect protected in their own regions and sometimes it's not possible. Therefore, we also, we need more focus on regional relocations because they are fast. Mm. But they are not always safe. But we need humanitarian visas, that, that's really crucial, or talent visas. We, we have to be able to get artists out. Other thing is, is funding. As we see, we also have to remember that also in Europe, we have right-wing forces in many countries and visa regimes are, are, are coming more difficult, but also the funding is dimin diminishing. Mm -hmm. Also, okay. I think it's, it's organizations working with human rights defenders. We have more and more work, and we have less and less financial resources at the moment. The mm -hmm. funding is being cut in many places. For example, for us, the Finnish Ministry of Foreign Affairs now made a decision that from the early next year, they are not going to fund at all, it is basically work to do with uh, 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 kind of to do with uh, 
peace. It is means that the whole department in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is cutting its all the kind of peace mediation work, which is really dramatic in the times we live in. What so we, we also have to take care of that, that mm -hmm. that's not happening in Europe at the moment. Mm -hmm. What about opportunities? Are there any at the moment? I think there are many, and therefore we continue to work. First mm -hmm. of all, what you said, that there's recognition mm -hmm. of the work of artists at human rights defenders and human rights defenders. We see that there's much, much more. It's also, there are countries, uh, to say that, for example, we really appreciate it's, it's, uh, what Sweden has been doing for the artistic freedom, among others, France. We will see what's going to happen after the elections and so on. That there is more awareness, there's more commitment, there's more commitment from the peers. So I think that there's always hope. And as I said, that it's basically, we need to do this work more than ever. But, but I think we have to join forces. It is within Europe and beyond and work more together in different levels, governmental, intergovernmental, civil society, artist organizations, and so on. Because there's also lots of knowledge for governmental actors, which is coming from the dissidents. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's also really important to be aware, protect them, and cooperate, because we, it benefits all of us. What kind of courage does it take from you and other civil society organizations to do this? I, I think it's, it's basically somehow, I think many, many of the people from this work who are doing this work are engaged people, are somehow kind of activist people who are doing it. Of course, we also we face threats, but you don't really think about it. I think what gives is the most carries, I would say, in, in our work are those art practitioners we work with, their courage, their amazing art, those moments when you actually see artists who are human rights defenders doing their artistic practice. It was a great moment now in the Venice Biennial, one of the artists from Iraq we have been working with is one of the main artists, Holut Havas, in the Nordic Pavilion. Uh, we work with uh, many members, for example, of uh, Belarusian Coordination Council, uh, Andrei Kurechik, others who are amazing artists, is producing their plays, operas, theaters, and so on. And I think that that gives courage because we work with our peers who are standing up around the world, and some of them are going back. Here in Sweden, there was an artist from Syria, Isatuma from Aleppo, He's back in Syria, he opened his gallery, he's doing his work. And I think that's what gives courage, is this kind of awareness that we work with peers and colleagues and we have to carry out this work. But we also, it is basically, I think that we just have to grow these networks and that gives us courage also to see it globally. Mm. That sometimes there are glimpses of hope, there are some political improvements in some regions something happens and the work goes on. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. <laughs>